The following is a presentation from Bethel Baptist Church and Pastor Al Fury. Glad that you're here. Let's go, Lord, in prayer and ask his blessing on our service. Brother Jim Judge, would you lead us in prayer this morning, please? Amen. Well, it is good to have the Holmes family with us this morning, and we're glad that Jennifer is here to sing for us. We're going to ask her to come to the platform at this time, and she's going to sing her first song. Door. He 
gently knocks, has knocked before, has waited long, is waiting still. You treat no other friend so well. Oh, lovely attitude, he stands with melting heart and wounded hands. Oh, matchless kindness, and he shows this matchless kindness to his foes. He is knocking, gently knocking, he is knocking at your door. Christ the living Son, the living Son of God, why will ye have him turn away? But will he prove a friend indeed? He will the very friend you need, the friend of sinners, yes, tis he, with garments dyed on Calvary. Admit him ere his anger burn, his feet departed, never return. Admit him o'er the hours at hand, you at his door rejected stand. He is knocking, gently knocking, he is knocking at your door. Christ the living Son, the living Son of God, why will ye have him turn away? He is knocking, gently knocking, he is knocking at your door. Christ the living Son, the living Son of God, why will ye have him turn away? Stand with me as we sing Glory to His Name, 586.
You know, when they came to get Jesus in the garden and they asked, are you Jesus of Nazareth? He just replied, I am. And they all fell down. What a, what a powerful name that Jesus has. And we're so thankful for this song this morning. One of my favorites, I am. Don't fool around, choir. Sing that thing. Savior. 
Hymn number seven, Blessed Be the Name.
Amen. Good to sing this morning. We are glad that you're here. We have a lot of visitors here today. We want you to make sure they feel welcome at Bethel Baptist Church, but none have come farther than Hannah's family. Hannah Patterson's got her family here all the way from Ireland, and we're so glad that they're here today and uh, enjoying that brand new grandbaby who they say, I'm sorry everybody else, is the most perfect baby in the world. So you lose and they win. But that's what grandparents think. And so we're glad that you got to meet the little one. Isn't she a blessing? Well, let's go Lord in prayer and ask our blessing on our service today. A lot of prayer requests for you. The Broughton family really needs your prayer. Brother Wilf Broughton uh, yesterday was struggling. They told him his kidneys were failing. He said, don't put me on life support, just let me go. And so today, uh, they feel like today that maybe sometime or even or tomorrow, perhaps. And so four of the siblings are up there. Doreen Roberts, one of the other siblings, is in Simcoe Hospital today, needs our prayers. And, uh, and so Wanda and Dave have stayed behind to kind of help her out. And then, of course, Leroy, Wilf's brother, uh, just got out of the hospital this week, but he's at home and, and uh, in recovery as well and cannot go up and see his brother at this time. And so just a struggle for that entire family if you'd be in prayer for them. I know they'd appreciate that. And Wilf and, uh, sorry, Wanda, and Dave just got over bad flus that lasted about a week and a half, and so they're kind of weak and tired and having to kind of minister to other people too, and uh, some of you know what that's like. And so would you be in prayer for the Broughton family at this time? Uh, I know they'd appreciate that, and you have some other requests for us as well. Good you know, uh, we were out calling on, uh, I think it was Thursday, Gerald and I, Gerald Ronson and uh, Dover, and you know, the, the Bible says go out and preach the gospel to every creature. And we think, well, oftentimes that's got to do with preachers. But no, it's for all of us. Because we're in this lady's garage and talking to her about the Lord just the way that we would normally talk. And she says, okay, she says, that's enough preaching. And we weren't forcefully using our voice. We were just preaching the gospel. And anybody can do that. Woman, man, child. People need the Lord. My heart was moved again this morning for Joshua. You know, that's the man that overdosed last week on heroin. And uh, he was in a coma. Well, they sent a letter out Friday. Brethren, God is answering our prayers. The doctors took Josh off life support. He has limited verbal response and smiled. We are all praising God. He has been moved to a private room from the ICU. They are still assessing the damage caused by the heroin overdose. The doctors all say there is still a long road ahead, but there is a road ahead for him. Praise God. God took that man and, and brought him back here instead of letting him pass on. And God's hand is moving in people's lives today. God's hand is drawing people to himself. Praise God for everyone that's here this morning. We're gonna bow in a word of prayer. Kevin, would you open in a word of prayer, please? Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this time to come here. Thank you for the worship we've had so far, Lord. Thank you, brothers, for this church, Father, to play as you bless us, sir. Bless us often, Lord, and use it if you please. Pray and you the families that are hurting, Lord, and the sick and in the hospitals, Father, and pray that you be with them. Heal the ones that are in your will, Father. The ones that are on the way to see you, Lord, pray that you bless them, bless their family, hold them close to you, Father. In your precious name, we love them.
we always enjoy having Mike and Jen and the kids come down and uh, they're special friends to us. We got, my wife and I, our first official date was with Mike and Jen, we had a double date. Um, and then when, when I proposed to Amanda, we were out at their place as well. Uh, it's a lot of good memories and I remember um, that last song Jen actually wrote. And uh, so she sent us uh, demos and she'd sing in her car, recording it on her phone and say, what do you guys think about this? And so it, um, it's, it's always good to have them. Um, Jen does, uh, does have a couple books that she's written. Um, and so she sings, she writes, she has all this stuff, whatever. Um, and so she, uh, uh, they're out in the foyer and uh, their encouragement, I know my wife's reading them in her devotions right now. Um, and she's written another book earlier as well, and then she has a CD. Um, and so if, if that would be a blessing to you guys, we'd encourage you to, to check those out, and they'll be in the foyer after. Um, we are going to uh, sing number 676, but we're going to pray, uh, and then dismiss our, our boys and girls for junior church. Lord, we do love you, and we thank you for this day. We thank you for already um, speaking to our hearts this morning uh, through, through music and through the encouragement of, of fellowship. I pray that you'd be uh, uplifted in the message as well, uh, that you'd be honored and glorified, and that you'd uh, challenge us with uh, a message from your word. God, we pray this in your name. Amen. So we'll stand number 676, Lily of the Valley, number 676. soul. I love that old hymn. We haven't sang that in a little while, so we're going to sing that this morning. It is well with my soul. I'm going to look up the number for you. Nothing like being prepared, is it? 375. 375. It is well with my soul. Feed the hymn books. And it looks like they're running up already. It is well with my soul. Let's sing it up this morning.
sin, all the bliss of this glorious lot. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Amen? Amen. Three are saved today. My sin, not in part, but the whole has been nailed to the cross. Revelation 1 verse 5 says the blood of Jesus Christ washes us from all of our sin. Isn't that good news today? Amen. Let's sing that third verse and sing it like you're actually saved this morning. All right? Let's sing it together. My sin. Six hundred and twenty-four. Six twenty-four. Jesus is all the world to me. Amen. What a great song. Any song that starts that way, good song. Six hundred and twenty-four. My life, my joy, my all. Jesus is all the world to me. Sing it this morning. Jesus is all.
you're singing this morning, Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. In your Bibles this morning, Revelation chapter 5. When I was a child, I thought that my great-great-grandfather wrote that hymn. It was written by William Thompson. And then I learned that there were lots of William Thompsons. And so it wasn't him. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. I want to share with you that on Tuesday, um, I went up to see, Brother Cody and I went up to see Pastor Chris Wyatt in uh, Cambridge. We were going to, actually this is going to sound strange, we were going to Fort Erie to Golden Harvest Baptist Church to support the meetings there with Brother Calvin Allen. And so we went to Cambridge on the way. That doesn't make a lot of sense, but uh, we went up to Cambridge. I, I'm going to be away the next couple weeks, uh, family vacation. Uh, my family's already down in Texas waiting on me. And so we're going to go uh, away. And I wanted to see Brother Wyatt before I left. And so we went to Cambridge and then we took the highway back over to Fort Erie for the meetings. But uh, Brother Wyatt uh, on Tuesday they uh, decided they've been, they've been getting him up in a walker and he can put weight on his left hand. He can't do a lot with it, but weight on his left hand and hold himself up. And then he would take one step with his right foot and then they would push his left leg forward. And they tried to get that muscle memory going and, and get going. And so on Tuesday, they said, we're going to let you try to do this on your own. We're going to three steps. We just want you to take three steps. And if you can take a step and then drag your foot. And so he took a step and dragged his foot. He took another, dragged his foot. He says, that third step felt so good. He says, I kept going. And he says, they had to chase me down the hall. He says, I went about 40 feet. And they said, every step you took looked stronger and better. And uh, they said, even you're starting to do heel to toe now. And so praise the Lord, he's coming along. And uh, one of the things he does for therapy is, he says, I thought this was silly because he said, I've never liked video games, but we've been doing Wii bowling. And he says, I put that controller in my left hand and I have to do this. And they said, do you see what you're doing? And I guess the whole thing about games like that is that you'll do things without even thinking about it. And he said, in order to let go of the ball, you had to actually let go of the trigger. And he was actually opening up his fingers and opening up, and he didn't even know he was doing it. It was just reflex. And so praise the Lord, that's a good sign. So he says, and now he says, I'm starting to move those fingers that I didn't know I could move. And so God is just bringing him along, and we're excited to see what, what he is doing with that. On Tuesday night, we went to the meetings at Golden Harvest, had a great time there. And his brother Calvin was preaching out of the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter uh, 3 and 4, I, I'm kind of one of these guys that when somebody's preaching, I'll, I'll often read before and after. I like to see the context of the area that we're preaching from and see what's going on. And, and while I was doing that, the Lord burdened my heart about Revelation chapter 5, and I, I started scratching out notes in the middle of his sermon and uh, about what the Lord was doing in my heart. And so I just want to share with you some thoughts from Revelation chapter 5 this morning that I hope will help you and encourage you uh, today in your walk with the Lord. And the Bible says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. Written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. Now, I want you to, if you could this morning, picture with me something. And let's, let's do this. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and start. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for all that you do for us. You're so good. Thank you for Brother Wyatt and the progress that he's made, and uh, almost a new ministry for him to sit and email and text different churches and pastors and encourage them by prayer and what a blessing it is to see those texts come in on a Sunday morning and Father I pray that you'd encourage his heart this morning and help him as he continues to recover we look forward to hearing him preach Father we pray for those others that are in need today we think of the Broughton family Wilford and Leroy and Doreen and, and Dave and Wanda as they carry this burden and, and, and so many others Lord that are hurting today that they need a touch from you Father, you know the hurting hearts in our church as well, and we pray that you minister to them and help them today. And so, Father, I ask for your filling. Help me, Lord, to preach what you'd have me to preach. Fill me with thy Holy Spirit. And, Father, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to, if you could, go back in time this morning. I, I, I don't believe in time travel. I don't believe that that's possible. But I, 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 do, I, I want you just to think of a time before Revelation was written. If you could, step into the Apostle John's shoes. John, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 that he was in the spirit of the Lord's day. He had been exiled to the Isle of Patmos, and there he was walking, and I can see him walking on the shore, and suddenly he hears a voice from heaven. And he turns and he sees this, the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory and his splendor there, standing, he falls down before him. 
And for the next several chapters, 22 chapters, we see the revelation of Jesus Christ to John. But understand, as John is receiving this revelation, he doesn't know the end of the book like you do. He doesn't see as if it's like you were reading it for the very first time. We'd come to Revelation chapter 5, for example, and we'd see this throne before us, and God on his throne, and the Bible says he was holding a book in his right hand. Now, we know what the book is. We can read through the next several chapters and we can see as God uh, unleashes his wrath upon a sinful and wicked world and begins to pour out judgment upon mankind during those days of tribulation that we know of, uh, of in the future. But if we are there for the first time like John, we might be puzzled. We might be asking ourselves, what's with the book? As God is sitting at his throne, I begin to ask myself, what about this book? I tried to clear my mind and think I've, I, I've not read the back of the book yet. I've not seen uh, how this all plays out. And what questions might I have about God sitting on the throne and holding a book? God doesn't need a journal. He never forgets a thing. He doesn't have to write down appointments, at least not for his benefit, but perhaps for ours. God doesn't need anything to remind him or to help uh, provoke his memories in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and if I were to see this God sitting upon the throne and holding this book, I would have to say that the message in it's for me. God didn't write it down for himself, but he wrote it down for me. And the Bible says in verse 2, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open this book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth unto all the earth. And he came and took the book. Out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. This morning I want to take a few minutes in Revelation chapter 5, and I want to qualify the message by saying this, I'm not going to explore the prophecy of Revelation this morning. I think sometimes that is better served in a Bible study time where we can sit down and open it up and compare Scripture with Scripture. But I'd like to give you some practical application that I see in the book of, or the chapter of Revelation chapter 5. Some things I believe that would help us spiritually this morning that would even encourage your heart. And so we're not going to dissect all the prophetic utterances and we're not going to look at all of what these things might mean. But we are going to take the principles and the applications this morning and I believe in the proper context. But I want you to notice, first of all, I want you to look at the book. Notice the book with me in chapter 1. The Bible says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book, written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. I want you to notice, first of all, I believe this to be a book of great worth, for it is held in the hand of God. Can I, can I ask you this? What other time in the Word of God is it recorded that God is sitting on his throne and holding a book? Revelation chapter 20 tells us that the books will be open, that the Lord Jesus Christ will open up the book of life and the book of the dead, and he will judge us out of those things that are found in those books. Or, and, and those that are in the book of life, found written in that Lamb's book of life, will forever be with the Lord. But those who are only recorded in the books of works 
will understand their works to be filthy rags. That they missed out on the grace of God and they are no longer, they are not recorded in the Lamb's book of life and therefore shall be cast in like a fire. But the only picture in the Bible we see of God sitting on a throne and holding a book in his hand is right here in Revelation chapter 5. I, I would say that that gives the book great worth. I, I know also that it's a book of God's wrath. We will soon learn, and I, I encourage you to look at this with eyes that have not read past chapter 5, but we will soon learn that as each seal is open, the, the book of God's wrath is poured out and judgment upon the earth. But it's also a book of God's will. It is God's plan for mankind as that judgment pours out upon the earth and, and man is, is judged by the very wrath of God, that, uh, the God that he did not believe in and the God that he rejected and the God that he crucified, he will come to know that he is God. It is the book of God's will. But then we see in verse 2, I want you to notice not just the book, but I want you to notice the angel. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy? to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. I want you to notice, first of all, he's a strong angel. A strong angel. That's, the, that's actually, interesting enough, that's the word that caught my attention. You read Revelation chapter 5, and there's a lot of interesting stuff there, but that one word is what jumped out to me because here's what I know about angels. It'll be an angel that binds the devil for a thousand years. They're pretty strong already. It was an angel, the angel of the Lord, that wrestled with Jacob throughout the night and prevailed. Angels are mighty created beings, and we, we can only imagine the kind of power that they might have, but their, their strength and their ability. The Bible talks about angels watching over children lest they dash their foot against the stone, and we know that they protect us and they, they take care of our needs. And Jesus spoke about ministering angels. He could call 10,000 of his angels if need be. It was angels that rolled the stone away. It was angels that struck those Roman soldiers dead at the grave. Angels have great power. So why would they call him a strong angel? Aren't they all strong? Brother Cameron, are you a pretty strong fellow? Well, definitely. definitely. <laughs> Brother Jim is, works in concrete, so I, I suppose he's got a little, bit, a little bit more strength than you. I don't know. It's probably how he got your daughter, amen? <laughs> Arm wrestling. But in a room of normal men, how, how many of you would say we're just kind of ordinary, right? Anybody here extraordinary in strength, in might? Maybe Gabe. Gabe works out. I wouldn't want to mess with him. But most of us are pretty ordinary. And if you lined us all up on the platform, all the men in the room, I don't think any one of us would look at the other and go, well, he's, he's a strong man. Maybe Bailey. Bailey. But, but looking at us, I don't think that we would all, we're just, we're just normal guys, we're ordinary, and nobody would stand out as extraordinary. And of all God's created angels, if you line them all up, there's one that would be called a strong angel. He stood out from the rest. You see, why is that significant? Because this strong angel was also a searching angel. And the Bible says he began to cry out, who is worthy to open the book? And everybody's going, you're the strong angel, buddy. And you can't do it? Think about what hope that might have offered. John the Revelator is standing there, and the Bible says this angel stands up and says, who is worthy to open the book? And John's probably thinking to himself, if he can't do it, nobody can. He's the angel that's been called strong. Matter of fact, the Bible says in verse 4 that John began to weep. Now understand, at this time, John didn't know what that book held. He had no clue. He just look, gazes upon the throne, and he sees a book in the hand of God, and he thinks, well, that's not for God. And I can see there's writing on the inside and writing on the back, and somehow God gave him an insight to what was written there. But he has to know it's for him. And he begins to weep because God's will cannot be shared with him and nobody is found. And the Bible says this, this angel uh, is calling out in verse 2 and he says, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And in verse 3, we see the candidates. Who might open the book? 
No man in heaven. There's your first candidate. It doesn't say angels, it says men. Those who are saved, blood-bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, those that have died and gone to heaven, and those that are rejoicing with our Father as we speak this morning, not one of them is worthy. Not your favorite preacher, not your favorite pastor, not your favorite missionary, none of the apostles, nobody. Not one. Then it says, nor in earth. The angel searched through the heavens and he searched through earth and nobody left on earth, nobody that was facing judgment, no great leader, no charismatic uh, president or prime minister or king or queen, nobody was found on earth that was able to open the book. And the Bible says neither under the earth. Nobody in all of history Whoever lived or died and was now buried in the dirt, nobody, nobody was found. And the Bible says not only could they not open the book, but they could not read it or even look thereon. Well, that's some book, isn't it? That's a special book. That the strong angel, the one of all, among all the angels that is labeled as strong, that stood out from all the rest, stood in the midst, and I believe God is making a point by that. And saying, there's nobody. And in verse 4, we see the sorrow. The Bible says, and I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And I, and I, I get an application from that. I'm reminded of the days of Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we read of a little boy named Samuel who was given to his mother Hannah, and when he was old enough, she took him to the temple, and she gave him to God to serve in the temple all the days of his life. And one day, as he lies sleeping in his bedchamber, the voice of God cried out unto him, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel leapt out of his bed, and he ran down the hall, and he found the prophet Eli. He says, you called? He said, no. After the third time, Eli finally woke up and realized it was the Lord. And he said, why would Samuel, a boy that had been raised by a godly mother and one that had been in the temple and, and, and serving under Eli, why wouldn't he recognize the voice of God? And there's a couple reasons. One, the Bible says that the word of the Lord was precious in those days because there was no open vision. God hadn't spoken a long time. And because God hadn't spoke, the word of God was precious. They hadn't heard from the Lord in a while. And there's another sad statement in 1 Samuel that says this, that Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Isn't that a terrible thing? Raised by the prophet Eli, and yet he had no personal relationship with God just as of yet. And maybe he was just too young and didn't understand it all. But there he was, serving in the temple, growing up under a prophet, had a godly mother who loved the Lord, and yet he did not know the Lord yet. And the word of God was precious because there was no open vision. I wonder today, do we weep if we don't hear from God? There's an application to be made in Revelation. John, here's John in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he's already written what God has told him to write for four chapters already. But it's like he just came to a roadblock. He's gone as far as he can and he desperately wants to know more and he wants to know all that God has for him. He wants to hear from this book that God has written. And the Bible says when no man could open it, he wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And I wonder, do we have a heart for God's word like that? Can I say this? If you never open the Bible, you won't have a heart for the word of God. Because the Bible says it's living. The Bible calls it a seed. Do you know what a seed does? When it gets in your heart, it grows. It is the bread of life. It is water that you'll never thirst again. Now, here's the thing I've learned about those things. Bread and water appeal to appetites. If you will lay off bread, and some of us should, amen, 
And I, I've tried to do that. I'm trying to lay off bread. And so if, if we're stuck and we're, having a, we're busy and sometimes we just have to grab a sandwich or something, instead of getting, getting a, a bun, I'll try to get a wrap. It's less bread. Because I just know bread's not good for you. And uh, so just try to, but if I eat bread all the time, you know what I found? That once I get away from bread, I don't crave it anymore. If you, if you don't drink water ever, some people, I know, I know a friend of mine in Hamilton never drinks water. He hates water. So he drinks soda pop all the time. That's all he drinks. I, th- I told him, I said, you know, if you just start drinking water, you'll start getting an appetite for it. Oh, I can't, I, I used to drink water. I can't stand the taste. I don't want water. Terrible. But you know what? You develop a taste or an appetite for those things that you feed yourself. If I eat salads for a week, you know what? That's all I want, salads. I enjoy them. My mind says I want a cheeseburger right now. But if I, can, if I can discipline myself to change my diet, your body starts adapting. And here's what I'm going to tell you this morning, that if you get out of the Word of God, you won't want the bread anymore. And you won't want the water anymore. Because, because it convicts us of our sin and it reveals to us who we really are. It's like looking in a mirror and seeing the things that we need to change in our lives and our appetites will begin to change. And, but, I, but I wonder, like John has now for four chapters written down the very words of God and when God holds the book and it's got seven seals upon it and an angel stands and says, that's all, we can't open the book. He weeps because he wants it so badly. Is that how you feel about God's word? I'm not going to suggest to you this morning that that book was the 66 books of scripture. I'm not going to suggest to you that, but this is what I do know, it was God's word. It may not be the God's word that we hold in our hands, but God had written it and recorded it and was held in his hand and whatever it had in that book was of significance and of great value. And John says, oh, we must have it. We must have it. But no man was found. In verse 5, though, we see the champion. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Now get ready. Everybody sitting down? Got your seatbelts on? Because I'm just going to read this scripture. I'm going to tell you, there, there are lots of exciting parts of scripture, but this one gets near the top. All right? John is weeping because he wants to hear from the word of God. And one of the elders saith unto him, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, And in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Hey, does everybody know who the lamb that was slain is? That is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world, who was slain upon the cross of Calvary. He, has, he is declared worthy by God because he has borne the sins of mankind and he has been victorious over death and hell. And the Bible says in verse 7, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Nobody else can do that. Nobody else can go up to God and say, I'll take the book. None of you would have the courage. I sure wouldn't. To get that close. The Bible says we can come boldly to the throne of God, but you and I both know that we're going to fall on our face before him. We're not attacking the throne. And the very closest we probably ever want to get is weeping upon his feet. But no closer. He is God. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. And he sits upon the throne in all his glory. But Jesus, the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world, the lamb that has been slain, walks up to the throne and he takes the book out of the right hand of him. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials full of olders, which are the prayers of the saints. They fell down before the Lamb. They worshiped Jesus. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. 
I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them that was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain. You'll notice that the four and 20 elders, the Bible says in verse 8, which many believe represents the church. The Bible says they sung a new song, but 10,000s of angels only speak. They don't know our song. They don't know what it is to be redeemed. They don't understand what it is to be a lost and, and, and on our way to hell sinner. And Jesus Christ rescued us and put us on the narrow path that leads to life eternal. They don't understand what it means to come through Jesus Christ to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And they say with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. I want you to notice some principles now that we'll give you and we'll be done. What a wonderful picture that we see of God sitting upon his throne holding a book. Of the angels stepping into the crowd and saying, who is worthy? And no one was found. And as John wept, one said to him, one of the elders, weep not, for the lamb that was slain is worthy. And Jesus stepped forth in Revelation chapter 6, he opens the first seal. And God's wrath begins to pour out upon the earth. Here's some applications that I think will help you today. Now, I told you we're not going to get into all the prophecy and all this. We've kind of given it, just read it to you. Here's a good principle. We walk around a lot of times defeated, don't we? Discouraged, hurting. A lot of people today, there's an epidemic. We just saw, I just saw on the news last night a couple people that, millionaires, lots of money, celebrity types that took their own lives this week. And you wonder, why is there no peace? Well, we know that without Jesus Christ, there can be no peace. We know that the devil is a murderer from the beginning and he's the father of lies and he deceives people to thinking that that's a viable way out to take your own life. But there's a lot of Christians today that have no peace either. They struggle with their past and they struggle with their sin and they, they think that people are looking at them and talking about them and worried about them and, and, and talking down about them. Let, let me say this and here's an application that I get from Revelation chapter 5. Nobody can open God's judgment but Jesus. You say, what do you mean, preacher? A lot of times we say, well, you're just, you know, I, I'm just worried about judgment. I'm worried. No, 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 don't worry about it. God holds judgment in his hand. Psalm chapter 118 says, I will not fear what man can do unto me. Only God can judge. Now, we sometimes... We make the mistake of getting the judgment thing confused. And we'll say, well, don't you judge me. Let me say this. Sin has already been judged. Christians are supposed to make judgment calls every single day. I'm not talking about that. If this, this brother down here, he comes to me and, and I find out that he has sinned against God and he sinned, and listen, it's my job. If a brother be overtaken in a fall, you which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest they also be tempted. That's my job, Galatians 6 1. I'm supposed to encourage and help. But if I say to him and he comes to me and says, hey, this is what I did, and I say, well, listen, brother, you know what? That's sin. That's not judging him, sin has already been judged. We're so afraid of telling people the truth anymore. And we've got homosexuals on parade and we've got rampant immorality and we've got marriage dissolving before our very eyes. We're in a moral mess in Canada and the whole world. Well, don't call it thin or you might offend somebody. No, come on. That is not judging people. 
That's just holding people to the standard of the word of God that sin has already been judged. And once we're sinners, by the way, for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God, I'm a sinner too. Then you can start getting help. You can find that there's a Savior whose blood has cleansed us from all sin. And we can be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so don't get judgment all confused. But what I'm saying, judgment is passing judgment upon somebody. Pronouncing a sentence upon somebody. And you need to stop fearing what man can do. Because let me tell you, only Jesus Christ holds the book. Nobody else is able to, listen, somebody might come up to you and mock you, or they might get angry with you, or they might uh, uh, curse you out or something. But friend, nobody has the power to judge you but Jesus Christ. You are safe in his hand. Let me turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 31. Now, careful, because this might make a Baptist dance right here. (laughs) What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I'm going to read more, but that's good right there. I'm going to give you a, a, I'm going to change a couple words there, and I'm not trying to take away from the word of God. If God be for us, who can be against us? If Jesus holds the book, who else can judge us? Amen? Read on. If God be for us, who can be against us? Look at verse 32. Romans 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, I I really believe today a lot of Christians walk around defeated. And the reason for it is because we're just wallowing in our sin. God has given you victory. Colossians chapter 2, there's a great verse there that Jesus took our sin and the ordinances. That's the law. The ordinances that condemned you, the law that condemned you, and the Bible says he nailed it to the cross. You, You don't have to walk around defeated all the time. We walk around and say, well, bless God. And and don't get me wrong, I'm a sinner saved by grace. But I put the emphasis on grace, amen? So many of us put the emphasis on sinner. Well, I'm nothing but a no good, dirty sinner. I'm just a worm and I don't deserve. No, we sure don't. But here's what I also know. I'm a prince in the kingdom of God. I'm a child of a king. You know, the world wants to show off their riches. They They haven't even seen my mansion with its gold sidewalks yet. It's nothing. Eye hath not seen, nor hath ear heard. And all the things that God has prepared for us. Who is he that condemneth? Oh, no one? That's because it's Christ that died. Nobody can point their bone. You know, listen, every day, every day, that devil points his bony old finger at you, and he says, you're no good. And you have no worth and you have no value. And God could never save you. And God, I, I've, I've talked to so many people that say, God could never save me. You don't know all the things I've done. They just need to read Apostle Paul's resume. You don't know the things I've done. Hey, God's greater than all your sin. And his grace is sufficient. And so we learn from Romans chapter, or Revelation chapter 5. Listen, God's in control of judgment. I'll turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And we'll close with this. 
Psalm 118, I won't fear what man can do unto me. Who is he that condemneth it as Christ that died? Who can lay to charge to any of God's elect it is Christ that justifieth? Matthew chapter 10. I'm sorry, I looked at the wrong long verse. I look at verse 27. Matthew chapter 10, verse 27. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in the light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Listen to this next part. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. Here's the good news. God sits upon his throne and he holds a book in his right hand. The lamb that was slain goes and he takes that book for he alone is worthy to open its seals. The God who holds all judgment in his hand also sees the sparrow when it falls. And you are more valuable than that sparrow. Friend, you want to know something? You are worth something to God. And I, I'm not here to give you some Joel Osteen motivational speech. That's not, that's not what I'm looking to do. But I, I am here to tell you, you can live in victory through Christ Jesus. And the good news is, is that when you stand there, the four and twenty elders, the church are there, and they looked on earth, and there was nobody because they're all about to be judged. I'm so thankful that we are not appointed unto wrath. That God's judgment is not for us, it's not for those that are washed in the blood of the Lamb like Israel of old as they waited upon the exodus. The Bible says they put blood upon their doorposts and their lintels and the God's judgment passed over them. And friends, I am washed in the blood of Christ. I'm a child of God and therefore his judgment will pass over me. I need not fear. And I won't afraid what man will do unto me. But the God that holds judgment in his hand has mercy in his other and he holds the sparrows and those two sparrows. How many, how many of you know what a farthing is worth? Two sparrows are sold for a farthing. It's not very much. And when only one of them falls, that's only worth half a farthing. They say this, that a farthing is so small that they would sell you two sparrows because they couldn't split a farthing in half. There was no way to make change. If you wanted to buy one sparrow, you had to pay the same as two sparrows. And so they'd give you two sparrows. And God says it's worth half the farthing. It's, it's the smallest uh, type of currency there was in the Roman system. And if one sparrow falls to the ground, he knows all the hairs of your head are numbered. The God that holds judgment and power and wrath and will pour out God's wrath. And the only one worthy to open the book also loves you very much. He's got your hairs numbered. And you're worth more than the sparrow that falls to the ground that God notices. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. It's my hope and prayer today that Christians would live victoriously. That we would start walking in the light. That we would start trusting God. Boy, I tell you, there's so many addictions out there today people looking for fulfillment and satisfaction in their life. There's so many today that are lives are spiraling out of control and taking their own lives. What we need is Jesus. And we fear sometimes the very judgment of God. No, the Bible says, whom he loveth he chasteneth as a father does a son. Yes, yeah, sometimes he has to get us back on the straight and narrow, but you don't have to fear about judgment. You're a child of God. And the same God that will judge this world has all your hairs numbered this morning and he loves you very much. Maybe there's one here today say, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. I, I don't know this God. 
I walk around just fearing his judgment, but I, I've never known his grace. I've never asked him to be my personal savior. I've never come to a point in my life where I recognize that I'm lost without Jesus and I must trust in him alone. I promise I'm not gonna embarrass anybody. I won't call you out in any way. But if you slip up your hand this morning with nobody looking around, I'd be happy to pray for you. My prayer won't save you, but I just wanna ask God to help you today. One that say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. If I were to die today, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. I'm fearful of the judgment of God, but if you come into God's grace, you don't need to fear his judgment. Is there one? Maybe there's some here today say, Preacher, I'm just, I'm just so thankful that God loves me. That God sees the sparrow when he falls and he knows my needs. You know, the, there's some here today that are hurting. And what a great reminder to know that the Matthew wrote recorded for us that, hey, don't, don't worry about it. I got every hair in your head numbered. I see the sparrow when it falls. I, you're worth more to me than him. Maybe we ought to just thank and praise him for a little bit this morning. Let's stay to our feet. The instruments are going to begin to play. If God has spoke to your heart, you may come to this altar this morning and pray. Seek God's face. Some need to praise God and thank him for what he's doing in your life today. God is good. Pastor Ferry, you may be seated just for a moment. <coughs> uh, Kingdom Builders Potluck. The Kingdom Builders class will ha be having a potluck after the morning service today. All are welcome. If you have no, not already joined the Sunday School class, this is a great opportunity to meet people in the class. Please let Mrs. Baker know if you're planning on coming. Uh, evangelism class. All are invited to attend a three-week class on evangelism. Mr. Uh, Crevar will be teaching it. Uh, the classes will be on Thursday, June 14th, 21st, and 28th at 6 p.m. in the Olive Room. Please bring a Bible. Uh, bus visitation breakfast. We are having a bus visitation breakfast on Saturday, June 16th at 9.30 a.m. All are welcome to come help visit our bus ministry. Summer day camp. Uh, we will be hosting a summer day camp on Tuesday, July 3rd and the 31st. If you would like to help,
please sign up in the foyer. Please be in prayer for this day that we'll be uh, able to touch base with our Sunday school kids and see some saved. Uh, one other note, donations needed. We'd like to be a blessing to the Montagudo family whose mother, wife passed away after getting, uh, giving birth to twins. The family is in need of baby items for the twin boy and girl. They have a small size uh, diapers that can be used uh, about anything, above anything. They, I'm sorry. They have small size diapers, but can use just about anything else. If you would like to give something to them, uh, there will be a table set out in the hallway for them. This will be the last week before we send it to them. You'll see the table out there in the hallway with diapers and other things on there. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus loves us. Thank you, Lord, that your eyes on this barrel. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to realize how much you love us and help us to love you, Lord, for the great love that you loved us with and help us to love each other and to love those that need to be saved. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.